during the last 500 years, contact between white civilization and remote tribes has followed two routes, both with disastrous consequences for indigenous peoples. Today, when most tribes are reluctant about contact with outsiders, explorer Sebastian Tirtiro travels around the world, asking them what kind of future they want to build. Following their expedition to Tanna, Sebastian and his team return to the capital of Vanuatu, Port Villa. They're preparing to visit Sebastian's other friends in the Vanuatu archipelago, the Kiai tribes on the island of Espiritu Santo. Larissa and Vali have been working with Sebastian for a long time, but for Aline, this is one of his first expeditions. Vanuatu is an 82-island archipelago, located around 1,000 miles east of the Australian coast. From Port Villa, the capital city of Vanuatu, we have a one-hour flight to Luganville, the most important city on the island. We have to ride across the southern part, then climb the mountains towards the village of Morakari in order to meet the Kiai. I think is the, the best way to do this with the tribes is, our, is the third way that we discovered. Is that I'm going there as a visitor first time, I make friends, but I come back because otherwise I'm a tourist and tourists come, buy the souvenirs, take the pictures and go home. And there's nothing left in between these two cultures. I think the difference between a tourist and a person who cares about those people is how many times you come back, what you do for them. And if you can find this solution between this struggle between the 16th century and 21st century. Espirito Santo is the biggest island in Vanuatu and also the least explored. The Kiai tribes are among the most isolated in the world and they're cut off from all modern means of access. In order to announce his arrival, Sebastian sent word two months before. The messengers established that the meeting would take place this morning at the market. Tafui is one of the young leaders of the Morakari village. In recent years, the villagers have started to come down into the city where they sell their goods and buy whatever they need, especially tools. The plan is to leave for the village early next morning. For the moment though, we're buying gifts for the Kiai. Okay. The situation here is completely different than any other parts of the world. The government here in Vanuatu allows the local people to manage their land. So it is a, an autonomy that gave them this freedom and this identity. And I think if, because you're going to see on the other islands, Santo, Villa, the resorts already got in. Uh, the Chinese people came with businesses in Luganville and took over and the local people are working as laborers for the outsiders. While in Tana, the leaders decided not to allow investors on the island, in Espiritu Santo, they were more liberal. And now most businesses are owned by foreign investors, especially Chinese. The official languages of Vanuatu are Bislama, French and English. Yet today in Luganville, Chinese is the second most used language after Bislama. The next day, we load our luggage and set off along the southern shore of the island, 
on our way to the Kiai. After a few hours' drive, the car can take us no further, and we need to leave it behind and start walking. Tafoi has left word with several men of his tribe to come down and help us with the luggage. We don't know how these small people will be able to carry our heavy bags. Tafoi manages to shoulder 100 pounds, while most of us are struggling to carry ourselves up the mountain. On top of everything, the climate makes physical effort extremely difficult. The temperature is around 40 degrees centigrade, with 100% humidity. Since they started visiting the city for commerce, the Kiai have been dressing up in city clothes when they leave the woods, so they're not laughed at. But as soon as they're back, they change out of these unnecessary trappings and back into the sapsapele, a piece of cloth wrapped around the loin and knotted into a belt. These high mountains attract a lot of rain, and the steep slopes can quickly become impracticable. It's only after attempting to climb these mountains that you realize why nobody came here until just 10 years ago. In 2001, a Canadian journalist from National Geographic was exploring the woods to take photos of some rare birds and ended up discovering the Kiai. In 2006, I found out from a small article, a very tiny article on the internet, that there was a tribe discovered, or I can't say discovered because the man that discovered it stumbled upon them by mistake. And he wrote that these people are very remote, they were using tools of wood and bone and so forth. So I got very interested in Vanuatu, so I started to research about Vanuatu. And um, I, I was actually surprised to find out that on such a small archipelago of 85 islands, you have a, a huge conglomeration of tribes. Uh, there are about 110 tribes in Vanuatu, about 115 languages. Um, so I started to plan an approach to Vanuatu in my attempt to find that remote tribe. Well, we're climbing to the, to the Kiai tribe. This is a very, uh, very challenging terrain. It's been raining for a few days and everything is slippery here. I love jungles, I love deserts, I love mountains. But when you're here and you do it, it's definitely much more difficult than when you sit at home and you watch it in a, ca in a video camera or on tape. See these people climb like complete agile cats, barefoot, no equipment. And yet they, they do it such such an ease. Me, completely exhausted. I want to go back, have a shower and never do this again. But I'm sure in a week I want to do it again. Since it hasn't rained too much lately, the water is clear and we can take a break and cool down.
The only source of potable liquid here is coconut water. While we freshen up, we can see that many of the men are familiar with the small vices of civilization. It's time to set off again, but our team is showing real signs of exhaustion. For Valley especially, this terrain is causing serious problems. Sebastian once again feels the after effects of his 2007 electrocution. When he undergoes intense physical effort, his muscles go into convulsions and he can't go on. Tafui tries to help him out and half an hour later we continue our climb. Sebastian's muscles are close to giving in, but fortunately, we're almost there. Shortly after, we meet Chief Moltorioru, who's waiting for us right outside the village. This is Chief Moltorioru from Morokai. The first, the first one that I slept in the house. From up in Morokari you can see the ocean and we notice that they're not that far from the city. It's the difficult journey rather than the distance that makes them so isolated. Hello. We're made welcome in the village and the last touches are added to the guests' huts. <laughs> Not long ago, repairing a roof would have taken a few days of work. Today, thanks to these new materials and tools, it takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, Sebastian gives out the gifts. A lot of people have to talked to me and said, we see you. You interfere with their culture. When you bring machetes and mosquito nets and all that. And first of all, I'm gonna sleep in their huts for a week or two weeks or three weeks. I'm using their water, I'm using their facilities, I'm eating their bananas. For this, I bring a gift. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you. They don't ask me to pay anything. I bring them something that they need. This is my philosophy behind it. Whoever doesn't like it, they should try go to a remote village without any gift and they will re experience on their own skin what it means to live with somebody for two weeks or three weeks and not giving them anything. The most warmly received is the fabric printed with flowers that they will use for their sap sapele. <laughs> We're invited to our first meal here, which consists of taro, an extremely filling root that can be boiled or baked, along with some greens. For the guests, there's even plates and cutlery, another sign of the Kiai's contact with the city. This is something Sebastian didn't see when he first came here in 2007. It's three years since I've been here last time. Can you tell him? But I came back because I want to help you more. Okay? Help the village more. Since he last saw them, Sebastian has visited other places and he's now bringing them news from other tribes. That's in South America in the Amazon. That's me, not Paul. Very cold. That's me, see? Him. Dressed in, this is animal skin because it's very, very cold. And I go with dog sleds like this. Tough life, you can tell them. 
they are killed a lot by other people. Hashem, what are their life? What are they doing here? And it's me fishing in Africa. There are several Kiai villages in these mountains. They live in small family tribal communities of 30 to 40 people and wear the traditional Sapsapele outfit, while the women wear tree branches to cover themselves. The Kiai are hunters, but they also plant gardens and raise chickens and pigs. Their small society is based on sharing. They eat together, cook together, and work together. Because everything is very wet, wood is carried home from the forest and dried for later use. They make fire inside the house so the rain won't put it out and the thick smoke helps drive away the insects. However, this dense smoke sometimes makes the air unbearable even for them and often makes their children more vulnerable to TB. Here, because of the mountains, it rains a few times a day, so most of the time they just shelter under the roofs and wait for the rain to stop. The ground is slippery. Even the kiai that grew up on these mountains suffer injuries every now and then. <laughs> Tepper seems to have broken his arm walking carelessly near his house, and Sebastian tries to set it. After a few days, his arm swells and they try a local cure. With an arrow, they make small incisions into the arm so that the bad blood can run out. When, when you fall, the body inside here has a lot of water, not just blood, a lot of water. So when the body hurts here, all the water collects in the hand. It's like a, like a bucket with water. The hunting and fishing is done by the youngsters. Tari is taking the younger boys to the creek where they hope to catch some rock lobsters. This can be done only when the water is very clear. Okay. It seems that no obstacle is too big for these skilled tribesmen. They use diving goggles in order to better see the lobsters hiding among the rocks and roots. This new technology that they purchased from town is making their lives much easier. And so, in just 30 minutes, they've got enough for a snack. They know exactly how much to fish 
so the lobster population is never threatened by extinction. They use the same method when they go fishing in the big river. But here, the process is much more difficult because of the strong undercurrents. They dive in and let the currents carry them downstream while they scout the river for fish. When they see the prey, they pierce it with an arrow as it swims by. You'd imagine that the chances of actually catching a fish are close to nil, yet Tari manages to do just that, despite the odds. On their way back, Morari picks some breadfruit, which will be cooked as a side dish for the lobsters and fish. While the meat is simply being fried, the breadfruit undergoes a more complex procedure. First, the fruits are baked in the fire, then the middle is scooped out. The pulp is then mashed into a sticky dough using a fresh coconut. The ripe coconut is drained of its juice and the flesh is scraped off. Water is added and it's squeezed to produce coconut milk. This milk is then poured over the hot stones. Finally, the breadfruit is covered in the boiled milk and it's ready to be served. With the key eye, almost every food is covered in coconut milk. Even game is cooked in the same way. Tari has managed to kill a wild cat. As he was walking in the forest, the cat ran to attack him, but he drove a machete into its head before the cat even touched him. Freddy skins the cat, which is then chopped up and boiled in, what else, coconut milk. Even though there are no large animals to hunt, the soil is rich here and the kiai have food to spare. Every family cultivates a small strip of land that feeds them. Anything beyond their needs is taken to the city and sold. Even though no one managed to reach them until 2001, the Kiai have been traveling to the city for a longer time and are now accustomed to the notion of money and buying and selling. However, it's not vegetables and fruit that are their main source of income. They make good money out of selling kava to the city for export to New Caledonia. The root of the plant is used to prepare a hallucinogenic drink, which is why kava has recently become increasingly popular. Sanmo, Chief Moltorioru's brother, takes some men and goes to the next village of Palakovanwa for the harvest. The trek is very difficult since everything is waterlogged and very slippery. The air is hot and humid, almost unbreathable, yet these people are perfectly adapted to this difficult terrain. They can easily climb the mountains by sinking their powerful toes into the mud. When the root is matured, men from several villages gather to prepare the harvest to be sold. 
But lunch comes first. Although they're guests here, Sanmo and Tari help to prepare the food. They eat clustered in families inside and outside the hut. After lunch, the men discuss their work strategy and the carver market prices. This is serious business for them, as carver brings about 90% of the village income. They plant the carver in the jungle and after a few months dig it up and keep just the root. The carver is loaded into sacks and carried down to the river. Here, the roots are washed, then peeled and cut into smaller pieces. This part of the process is very important. If they clean the root well, the carver could be considered higher quality and sold at a better price. After being cleaned, the carver is spread out to dry in a hut near the river that was specially designed for the purpose. <laughs> Under the grill, they set a fire and then supervise it for a couple of days until the root is properly dried. It's a lot of work, but it pays off. Just 10 years after being first contacted by outsiders, they use cell phones to contact their bulk buyers in town. When the carver is dried, it's already pre-sold, and they just need to carry it down to Luganville to collect around five US dollars per pound. Every now and then, the young play a traditional game in which the rules don't appear to be very strict. The main idea is to knock small rocks from a designated area by throwing other rocks at them. However, lately they've become much more interested in football, even though on a field like this it can turn into quite an extreme sport. It's Wednesday morning, we are climbing up to the water source where we're going to install the water system for the Morokai people. Behind me, you can see the mountains of uh, deep central Santo Island. 
These people are hidden somewhere here, all the villages, you can't see them right now. They live in an amazing terrain, extremely challenging to, to get to them. And yet they have managed to survive here without any need from outside um, uh, until now. The, the greatest uh, problem that they have is, is getting water because they have to walk several mountain ranges to, to get a little bit of water for, for uh, drinking. But their need is, is much greater than their children need to be washed, they need to cook, they need to, to use water in much greater quantity. This is how we, we're trying to help uh, here. Cold and clean. Oh, wow. We have finally arrived at the water source for the villages uh, down the mountain. Um, our plan is to develop a reservoir right here to dig into the mountain. It, the challenge is bringing the seven kilometer pipe here and uh, a fiberglass reservoir to, uh, to build the reservoir right here. Then these people have to carry the pipe up and they have to bring it down and roll it uh, towards the, the villages. It's something that I, I can't imagine doing. I don't know how they're gonna do this, but these people are tremendous uh, uh, survivors, uh, very resourceful, and I think um, this will, will be a, a tremendous blessing for the villages down, uh, down the mountain. In 2009, two years after his first arrival here, Sebastian managed to finance the development of a seven-kilometer water system that provides free water to the Kiai in their villages. <laughs> I am a Sebastian As I decided to come back year after year to see how we can help them, I discovered that a lot of the children on this island have malaria, as they have on most of the islands in Vanuatu. We started delivering mosquito nets and going from house to house and you know showing them how to use the mosquito nets for the children and so forth so uh, i became very close friends with them and they discussed they started to show me who they are their culture their dancing their singing their their understanding of life these people as i saw them first time had a lifestyle that was unchanged for many uh, many years This is Sebastian's fourth visit here, but it's a very important one. The Kiai have decided to adopt him as a member of their tribe. Once they hear the signal, the surrounding villages make their way to take part in the adoption ceremony. The first to come are the village chiefs, followed shortly by the rest of the villagers. All visitors bring tokens of goodwill and no one comes empty-handed. Chief Moltorioru is setting the final details of the ceremony with the other chiefs. Dressing up in Sapsapele, Sebastian is prepared by Tafui for this important event. Uh. 
After Sebastian is properly dressed, Chief Moltorioru gives a speech to the tribe at the beginning of the ceremony. The pig is an important animal in this tradition. Hitting the pig on its frontlet is the sign of somebody becoming a chief. Now Sebastian has not only been adopted, but he's also become the son of the chief. The leaders go to Naviota. This is forbidden to women and non-members of the tribe. This is the place where the witch doctor goes when someone is sick, asking for healing. They call it the medicine house. Oh, custom so na na kini mamo sa sakit dalam malawan. So na nibrata kun mutsaw lagi ay wano so na numapli mo alas nila isa pa lalo ni mag. Nito na takuna di otom. While the leaders are initiating Sebastian, the rest prepare the food and the kava drink. As there are many people gathered for the event, a lot of food has to be prepared and several fires are started in different huts. Stones are placed on top of the wood. After being heated, they'll help the food to cook evenly. The women are cooking lap-lap, a traditional Vanuatu dish. They peel manioc, a root which is similar to sweet potato, and grate it. The manioc is squeezed of its juice and turned into a dough. Then it's placed on banana leaves and shaped into a pie form. At the end, coconut milk is squeezed on top. They close up the parcels and place them onto the hot rocks. Then more rocks are placed on top. The rest of the roots are cooked whole in the same fashion. Everything is covered with leaves. This way the heat is kept inside. In two hours, the lap lap is ready to be served. Some of the men prepare the drink. The carver roots are peeled and cut into small pieces. They're then placed in a pipe with a closed end and pummeled with a stick. They used to use a bamboo device to do this job, but today, plastic is more convenient. 
The resulting paste is mixed with water in order to extract the hallucinogenic juice. After being filtered through a piece of cloth, the drink is ready. Before the eating and drinking comes the last part of the ceremony, the dancing. The men gather outside the village and approach singing as they go. Once they reach the center, they're joined by the women and children. beautiful day and that uh, it was a very special day for me now they are my family and After so much waiting, everyone is anxious to eat. All the ovens are opened and the food is transferred to pots and taken to the center of the village. It's then laid on the ground on leaves, the lap-lap, the baked roots, the pork and the chicken. Until everything is ready, tree branches are waved in order to keep away flies and other insects. Everyone takes their food and finds a comfortable place to eat. After the meal, all the men drink kava, as is traditional, although they're not all great fans of the taste. If we realize at the end that not only that we, we don't have to destroy them to make them civilized, we don't have to leave them as, as animals in the zoo uh, and don't touch them because like dolphins, we don't have to interfere. Oh, both, is, both is ways I believe, and I, I've been saying this all along, they are wrong. They're wrong to destroy a culture to make them civilized and they're wrong to live them the way they were and die like animals because they're not dolphins. They're not whales, they're not polar bears. They are human beings. It's my humanity in me that says that. And secondly, it's my promise to myself when I was a younger boy that I would do anything I can to help people that cannot help themselves. 
So whether you like it or not, I found the third way, the best way. Uh, we have water now, nice water yeah. everywhere. It's good. Yeah. What what else do you need? What's the next one? And you can tell Jessica. Light. Light. Yeah. Solar. <laughs> solar light. Solar light. Yeah, but that's what you told me. That's what you told me. We can we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, medicine. 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 Yeah. Like a clinic. Yeah. Clinic. Yeah. For the people. Okay. Before his departure, Sebastian wants to measure the village and make a brief sketch for a future solar-powered lighting system. One, two, three. He needs to measure all the huts and the distances between them while considering the position of the sun in order to have an accurate estimation of the cost. Then comes the difficult part, looking for financing. If he succeeds, this could change their way of life for better or for worse, depending on how they choose to make use of it. So the terraces, and then next house, next house, next house, next house, until we catch all of them from this box, and we go like this. Like this. It seems that the third way carries with it the risk of freedom of choice. The risk that they will use the things they get in the wrong way. I see a common thread in all of these cultures. That they were all trying to figure out what hit them and why is so much difference from what their parents are telling them that they used to live and what, what they experience today. And they're trying this young generation in between the Gen Xers, 30, 35 years old, they're trying to figure out how to take the best from both. And usually they take the worst from both because they're given that, they're fed, they're fed that. And that's why they, they're going down so fast. So I think we have a, a beautiful opportunity to see an explosion of new ideas coming both from and to these tribes that could actually save them and actually in turn also heal most of us that interact with them. Be whatever, okay? <laughs> All right? This way the whole village has lights. And I can see it from Lugamil. <laughs> when I stay in Lugamil, I see Morokari light. <laughs> <laughs> it's now time to go. It's an emotional moment and it will probably be one year before Sebastian returns, hopefully having everything he needs to develop the solar power system that the Kiai are waiting for. Chief, thank you too much. See you soon. Look at you, look at you. Look at you. In the next episode, Sebastian travels to Vietnam for his first contact with the Hmong tribes.